by Medhelosnet Podcast and Vahan Setian. We are honored and thrilled. Uh, you can all join us here live in person. I'm your host, Vic Aslanian, and as always, I'm joined by my multi-talented co-host, Mr. Mike Balian. Thank you, sir. Say hello. Thank you, sir. <laughs> hello, everybody. Um, we are streaming live on YouTube and Facebook uh, for the world to see, so give yourselves a round of applause for being here. Uh, this is a very important topic which is dear to all of us as Armenians around the world. If you have not heard about Medheros.net, we are a historical podcast um, that cover Armenian culture, uh, basically events from the early days of the Armenian highlands all the way to modern history. We invite historians and intellectuals to help us learn more about where we come from. Well, why history? Well, we believe that history is the fruit of power. The knowledge of history is one of the wealthiest possessions one can have. When you know your own history and combine it with world history, it will help you make better decisions in life, sometimes even predict the future, from the historical examples of great people and events before our time. Now, growing up in the United States, now at our young age of 24, um, Right. Yeah, right. I think you're turning flip, flip right? the numbers. Flip yeah. the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and the recent war in Artsakh, we realized that you know ourselves don't know much about our own history as Armenians. Um, you know, we know the typical bullet points: Stephen the Great, King Tartad the uh, Third, Gregory the Illuminator, 301 A.D., um, Mesrop Mashto, and so forth. Uh, but to dive deep and learn factual history and what took place, the average Armenian does not know. So then the Medheroset podcast was born. Um, we just recently celebrated our one year anniversary. One year anniversary yeah. First birthday, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. yeah. Didn't think we'd make it this far. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Um, and the rest, as they say, is history, right? Um, we, uh, th 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 we've had, we've reached an audience all over the world. We'd love it. We can't believe this has happened. Yeah. Not only Armenians, but also other nationalities. I myself have had friends from Australia and various different countries, non-Armenians who listen to the podcast regularly. Uh, the feedback we get is our history is as important as world history because it's so linked and tied into everything that happened in that part of the world. Right? Well. Uh, before we begin uh, and bring our guest on stage, we wanted to give you guys a brief biography. Uh, Vaughn Setian is the Universal Ambassador and Domestic and Foreign Affairs bestowed by the Seven Council Fires of the Ocheti Chakowi Treaty Government Organization, Dakota Government Branch of the Sioux Nation of Indians. He has appeared as a guest in numerous television and radio show invites, including Red Ice Creations, Hai Doom, and Jim, uh, Jimmy Church Live, and also Medhead, obviously. Um, he <laughs> Thank you. And uh, he has been interviewed by experts in their fields. He has published academic and research-oriented work and has done presentations on varied topics, including ancient languages and world history of Native American and indigenous affairs, financial incentives, and industrial psychology. He is the author of several books, including Armenian Origins of Basques, and is currently working on the upcoming Volume 2 of Language as Fingerprint. Volume 1 was published in 2014, as we know, reaching a global audience. He has authored articles such as Industrial Hemp Production in Indian Country, Chronic Disease Management in Indi Indian Country, and Letter to Humanity, Genocide and Ethnocide of the Native Americans. His 2020 publication, The Tipping Point, Healthcare Woes, COVID-19, and Future of Native Health, is groundbreaking and the only inside critical and unbiased view of the current economic and societal genocide issues of the Native Americans and possible future economic development and healthcare solutions in the post-pandemic era. His efforts and contributions in economic development and healthcare for served communities and veterans have been officially recognized and acknowledged by several key organization, organizations and institutions, including Asian American 
National Committee, Department of Justice, and the White House as he established the first, first terminal illness and chronic disease management program on tribal lands under the presidential mandate. He is a participating member of the Association of Former Intelligent Officers and is currently collaborating with state, federal, indigenous, and foreign government leaders and associations on economic development, healthcare, and cultural preservation, as well as historical and heritage defamation issues around the globe raising concerns to UNESCO, the UN, and the international courts. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to present Dr. Von Satyan. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for being here. OK. <laughs> Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Well, thank Thanks you. for the introduction. Have a seat. Thank you. Please. Okay. All right, everyone. First of all, we want to thank everybody for being here. Um, if you guys can turn off your cell phones or put Please. them on mute or lower the volume. Um, this is, uh, like we said, this is a very important topic. Uh, falsification of our history and culture is a ongoing war that started hundreds of years ago, I would say. Um, and Vahan Setian has been a guest on our podcast many times, and we've talked about this topic, but you know, we've kind of touched around it. Um, but this is a very important event that we need to do for people to wake up and see what's going on. As Armenians, we're losing the information war. They are taking away our history from us. And this history is so important. And if we don't preserve it, if we don't teach it, first of all, to ourselves, as I mentioned, a lot of us at our age group don't know what our history is. It's shocking. Yeah, it's very and shocking. we need to teach this to our kids. So, um, again, Vaughn Satyan, thank you so much thank for doing this. Thank you for sure. joining forces with us to have this conversation. Um, so, well, what I want to do is uh, I want to go over the slides uh, with the audience. Um, I didn't, I didn't bring any notes, so I'm just going to speak from my heart. Uh, hopefully. My memory will serve me well. We started late, so I have two wines in my stomach, so <laughs> hopefully I can remember what I'm going to say. Uh, but uh, this is something very important, and uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll just go through the slides. Uh, pay attention to the flow. Everything is connected uh, on the presentation, so um, if you're going to take notes, great. Uh, but uh, I assure you, all the slides are interconnected, interwoven. And uh, at the end, it will circle back to, to the idea of why we're doing this, why is it important. And at, uh, very, very specifically, uh, whatever I'm going to talk about today uh, is relevant to all cultures uh, of the world. That's the main thrust of this presentation, especially cultures that have a history. Every culture wants to preserve their history. They want to a history that is presented well and accurately without any misinformation. So I hope that whatever I give to you, you can take it away, whether you are mean or not, um, to use it you know, for, your, for your own benefit as far as uh, supporting uh, your cause for your own culture, making sure that your, your culture doesn't fade. In the Armenian history, uh, it's much more severe. Actually, uh, the situation is very dire. Uh, it's 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 hanging on a thread, and if we don't save it, uh, we're not going to see Armenia within the next few years, uh, especially in historical books. So we got to kind of look at this from a sense of urgency standpoint because it's it's really uh, a very chaotic situation out there. Um, as, as they said, yes, I am involved in government. I I do work with you know, various organizations. And we do consult with the universities across the world. And Armenia's history, especially in the United States, is pretty bad. Uh, universities in the United States uh, falsify Armenian history in a, in a very bad manner. So we need to kind of uh, put that out there. Uh, we're not here to name any names, but I want to let you know with some examples of how bad the situation is, especially for those who have no idea what's being presented, uh, especially with university professors who have this extraordinary accolades 
uh, they have you know several PhDs and uh, all these awards and they help each other out and they 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 help each other publish. They get funded extraordinarily well to publish. Uh, but if you look at the the entire content and the data, it doesn't jive. It doesn't connect to what we see at the scientific level, at the genetic, you know, at the comparative level. We don't see it from archaeogenetic standpoint. So it's it's it has a big void, and we're trying to make sure that. Uh, Void is filled. That, that, that. Are we okay with this? Um, are we okay with the mic? Check, check. Uh, hopefully the uh, the mic wouldn't fail me, but I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna okay. walk around. We're gonna get out of your way while you do this, oh, and good. then we'll come back. And Floor is on Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. So, uh, are we okay with the lights? All right, great. Again, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we have also a very special guest, but I want to thank Karakin uh, for putting all this together. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, this was going to be a small event, but turned into this extraordinary thing. So thank you very much for the for the art show and the cocktails and, and the music. And uh, it, it feels like a gala. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, especially for this type of a topic. You know. Usually have superstars going back and forth, but in our case, uh, it's a huge privilege. So thank you very much. Uh, we also have a very special person, Tuan Yuyen. He's the chairman of the Asian American National Committee. Uh, he's part of the UN uh, for the uh, refugee cases at the same time on hate and hate speech and defamation. So Tuan, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. <coughs> So as far as uh, what I'm going to present, uh, just follow through, and uh, the, the slides will give you kind of the idea of what the next uh, topic is going to be. But <clears throat> very important, the, uh, the way we look at things, if we change the way we look at things, those things change. So uh, if we kind of, when we change the way we examine things, let's say, things we examine kind of change. So. We have to look at things from different perspectives. And we have to include that in our historical data, in our historical research for us to get a very good picture of what we are presenting and what we are telling to the audience. Now, the, uh, as far as for the introduction, um, if you look at this uh, image, um, if you look at the light source, you know, you can have, let's say, from one angle, let's say, comparative linguistics, on the other angle, genetics, on the other angle, archaeogenetics. But if you look at the historical truth, it requires all those items together for us to be able to figure out what we're talking about. And this can be a historical truth for anything. Anything that we examine. So whatever is being given to us, I think it's a very good idea to not only include all these ideas, but also logic, rationality, and reason. It doesn't matter how many PhDs they have. If something doesn't make sense, it should be discarded, or at least questioned to a certain extent. And I think it's time for us now to start really re-examining as what being, what's being fed uh, to the students at the universities. And uh, when I do have discussions with professors, you know, sometimes they get stuck because uh, when you bring new information into the fold, they have this difficulty of, of digesting it because they have spent so many years going through schooling and publishing paperwork and then one discovery can change it all. Look what happened in the uh, 1990s when Portasar was discovered. Right? Uh, you know, we use Gobe and Tepe, but let's say Portasa. Uh, have you seen historical books being revised at a grand scale? No. You don't see it. Because those professors have spent hundreds of years putting it together. So Portasa is not very important because it will destroy their career. And it has. Uh, so if you look at this map, uh, you can see like kind of the waves. Something happened in Port Asar and, and then eventually in Giza. Pyramid. Something happened 15,000 years ago when the ice was melting and so you had these regional floods and so forth where the, all the other ideas of you know, the mythology and, and floods, local floods happened. If you look at this map, um, some, some people say it's bigger, but if you look at this map right here, uh, this constitutes the extent 
of Armenia from a historical standpoint. You know, of course, some people say you can go further down a little bit. But as far as taking cons in consideration of all the historical data, of all the linguistic data and archaeogenetics and so forth, you know, this constitutes a, a rough idea of how big it was. As you can see, it's half of Turkey, you know, goes all the way to Georgia and then Azerbaijan and then down to Iraq, Iran. And uh, interestingly, all the firsts of civilization, from hunter and gatherers to human civilization, all the firsts happened there. If one thing, let's say, was one in Japan and then the other one was all the way in New Zealand and so forth, but that didn't happen. We have the oldest shoe, we have the oldest skirt, right? We have the oldest winery, uh, we have the oldest, oldest agriculture, animal domestication, all happened at the same place. So something happened. Now, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the theories of astronaut theory and all that, but, you know, there had to be some inception of information that came down or how it was sprang up from somewhere for those people to go from hunter and gatherers all the way to human civilization and for them to have structured religion, you know, structured animal domestication and, and, and language and so forth, the petroglyphs and everything else. Only in Armenia you would find petroglyphs that look like writing. In other places you see a horse and a cow and everything else. But in Armenia you see abstract, abstract, you know, hieroglyphs and, and petroglyphs. So 15,000 years ago there was a lot of ice all around. As you can see, the, uh, the Persian Gulf kind of is closed up a little bit. Um, and at the same time, uh, initially it wasn't called the Persian Gulf. A uh, long time ago it was called the Sumerian Gulf, and then it was changed into Persian Gulf. But we'll go into that in a bit. So all the ice uh, melted, obviously went down uh, into the, the Sumerian lands, and then that's how basically the idea of a flood came in. I mean, if you're an ant and then you have a drop of water, that for you that's a you know, global flood. So it can mean anything for those people especially if their world is very small. If it's a city is flooded, that's it. The entire world is, is flooded. So that's fine. You know, let's, let's take that with a grain of salt. As you can see, even in uh, historical books that they describe the, the melting of the ice, they still put Kingdom of Urartu as Ararat, which some of our professors can't even contemplate the idea, right? What is Urartu? Uh, Urartu never happened. They were never were, were Artians. Okay, I'll, I'll go into that. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, we usually surf the Facebook and, and so forth, and, and we kind of find certain things that it's, it's, it's asinine. So, uh, this is a, a wonderful website because it talks about the uh, Indus Valley, you know, the cultures and civilizations, because it's very important for us to understand and and learn of different cultures, right? It's very important. We need to respect each other and, and how we contributed to one another to human civilization. Now, this page has about 534,000 likes. So as you can see, it's already being shared by a lot of people. Millions of people are sharing this data. And then uh, they have this post. Now, uh, they do talk about that, and, and they connect it to the Indus Valley and its etymology and how it's connected to India and so forth. Now, this was found in Lake Sevan in 1973. Now, whether this is a spaceship or not, it's 3,000 years old. But, you know, we don't have to say it's a spaceship, but, you know, it, it looks like it, that's fine. So you have... <coughs> And uh, so we can say it was found in Toprakal in modern-day Turkey, or we can say found in Tushba, ancient Armenian, modern-day Turkey. It ha it has, the language has to be very specific. If you say it was found in ancient Turkey, it doesn't make sense. But our professors use it. So if the students are dumber than a potato, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna accept that because it's a professor, okay? They have no idea uh, the, uh, the difference between ancient Armenia and ancient Turkey because it's the same location. So we, are, we need to be very careful because that word disseminates and now we have, it's a, it's a runaway train now. It's a runaway train. We can't get it back. So now we're fighting this war between millions of people who are being funded uh, to falsify information 
against few people who are trying to say, no, you know, you're wrong, but they're not being funded. So we're really underhanded here. Now, when they posted this, I, I actually you have right, you have a lot of comments and people just say opinions, but those opinions don't matter. But I want to give you an example about misinformation that flows to millions of people. So one guy goes, you know, it's in ruins in Turkey. Uh, doesn't say modern Turkey, it says Turkey. So that's already a problem. Two, and then Indian guy goes, Turkey was once India. Now he has, uh, but I want to show you something. Okay. It has four to more than 14,000 likes and has 3,239 shares. So you can imagine how far this confirmation has gone, right? Now all of a sudden, Turkey was India. Huge problem. And you're dealing with you know, hundreds of millions of, uh, of people that are sharing this false data about people who are only 10 million and 99.9% .9 of them have no idea what the hell is going on. They just go day by day with their lives, have no idea that this type of information is going through. And, and uh, we find false information on the news or what have you, and then we get mad. Why didn't they say this? Why? Well, of course, if nobody's paying attention, who cares? Now, uh, Tushpa has always been mentioned as part of Armenia, even in, in, in old maps. So they're not saying that either. So they have artificially kind of separated Urartians from Armenians, even though they're the same people. There is uh, Urartu and Urartians are artificial people. They never existed. It's Armenians. That's it. Now this is the extent of Urartu, uh, 7, 715 uh, BC, and you have all that extent. You know, you, Urartu is you know part of uh, Lake Urmia. You have Lake Sevan, and then you know over there you have Lake Van, all part of the Armenian Kingdom. So Urartu is basically Ararat. Uh, it's three letters, three consonants. Either you can read it as Urartu or Ararat. And the thing is, it's an Assyrian accent. So the the Semitic people have used. Urartu as part of their, their missing of vowels and their vocabulary on the way they, they write things. So, of course, we're going to have this, uh, this disinformation happening. But the thing is, we're not aware of it. All this started without the Armenians first. So, Armenians were never involved in the examination of their history. And it's still going on. When was the last time you heard that all the excavations happening in Portasar in Turkey, you have Armenian professors all over? You don't. Okay, so I'm going to make a couple of things. Now, Urartu is Armenia is basically the same thing. The trilingual Buhistan uh, indicates that uh, Armia, Urartu, Armina, and Armenia in all the different languages is the same people of the same land. But all of a sudden, they got separated from their own. Now we're different people. And uh, obviously, this is about falsification. So I'm going to give you examples of falsifications, real examples from a university book. Okay, before I go into that, this, this map is familiar to all of you, right? You have Palestine, then eventually it goes into smaller and smaller chunks. Uh, and uh, they're being stripped off their lands. Genocide, culture, side, and happening. From 1946 all the way to 2010, that's how small Palestine is in green, and then how big Israel is. Now, this is historical Armenia. Again, as a map, it's another representation, but you can see the current Armenian white and then how big it was. Okay, so I want you to go into that that time where how big that thing was. At that time, there was no Georgia, there was no Iran, there was no Turkey, and there was no Azerbaijan. Very important. We have to go back in time. Okay, when we go back in time, things make sense. Now, same thing is happening to Armenia now. Smaller and smaller as, as lands are given here, there, being disseminated. 
and it's it's turned into like a smaller version of, of, of Spain and Portugal kind of a kind of a way. So this is going to happen uh, eventually. Nothing is going to be left until we are intellectually ready, intellectually fighting this war, and physically. Now this is thing, uh, this is the genocide map. Uh, as you can see, the entire spectrum of, of ancient Armenia. You know, ninety percent of Armenia was lost to the genocide in 1915. Ninety percent. And the population about 60, 60 more than I think it was more than seventy percent of people died. Uh, they were killed, murdered, drowned, heads cut off, nipples cut off. You know, uh, pregnant women died. You know, with the sword and, and the baby inside. So all this happened. Do we actually think that that memory is still not in the Armenian culture? Or, or memory is still there. We just don't recognize it. it. It just comes out in a different way. The agitation, the, the strife, and, 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 and the conflict, and all that, why people are so mad, and all that. It's all part of that memory that still is intact in our, in our DNA. Okay, these are some photos of the genocide. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to watch this stuff and, and not realize how, how an ancient culture that gave so many firsts to human civilization has, has turned into ashes. Not only that, but we're still fighting. We're still fighting a cultural genocide, historical genocide that's happening. And uh, something similar to us is the Native Americans, which I'm very involved in. Um, I'm very glad and I'm very blessed that um, I've been adopted into their family. I have a eagle's feather from Crazy Horses clan. Um, I went through a six hour ceremony and uh, I was given a black horse as a name. And uh, Native Americans are very humble people and very spiritual so it's a, it's a blessing for me to, to work with them. And they share a lot of things that we share, especially with their genocide happening now. But their genocide is different. They're having healthcare genocide. There is no healthcare. Okay? The federal government wants that. They need their lands because they have a lot of oil and gas and lithium, right? So instead of committing direct genocide, let's give them, you know, an asinine healthcare system. They'll just die eventually. Um, they have diabetes, cancer, and uh, they can't even go into a hospital for a heart surgery because they belong to another hospital across the United States. So they need to fly out an 11-year-old child and then she dies on the way. Um, I've lived on the reservation and I've seen a lot of deaths. <coughs> so 30,000 orphans are out of the genocide. Can you imagine what's happening to the kids? assimilation, rape, uh, you know, their mothers and fathers all gone. Now, this is an actual sentence from a historical book that is being instructed in the United States as a professor for, th for I would say, maybe 30 years. Um, can you see it? Can you read it? Uh, I want to read it to the audience. The proto-Armenians migrated into eastern Anatolia, the Armenian plateau, in the mid-6th century BC. Just after the fall of the Urartian Empire, there they mingled with the indigenous people. Um, if, if, if you're a student, if you're an American student, have no idea about geography or history, for you it's okay. You just glance it through. So basically in one sentence, it's dividing the Armenians into two, saying that one came from the other, they intermingled, and then they took over the indigenous people that never existed. So in other words, they took over them themselves. 
When we change the way we examine things, the things we examine change. This is another sentence from there. Actually, this is an actual sentence. The ancestors of the Armenians were invaders to the Armenian highland who have migrated to Armenia in the 6th century BC. Let that, let that sink in. Let that detonate in your mind what they're actually saying. And nobody is kind of talking about it. And it's being reprinted. And it's being fed to people and everything else. Oh, by the way, you can, do, you can research on your own. This is all out there. You can buy the book and, and read it. You know, I'm not here to pinpoint any people. They know who I am. And I'm glad I'm here with my position that I hold because I want them to know that I know what they're doing. The national uh, consciousness of the Armenians about their identity is nothing but a collection of beliefs. Okay. Not only are you an invader, you also have all these ideas we're talking about. It's just, it's just imaginary. This is the book. There are so many examples. I just want, see the thing is for me to explain something, I have to give you an example. With, I mean, I can't really say something without the entire pictures. You know, remember, the, we gotta give the entire photo, photo of, of the, uh, the, the portrait of things. Well, this, this is one of the books. There are many like that out there, okay? Very, very, very important for you to read this stuff and, and uh, address it to the university that publishes this. Now, you know who he is? Armin Ayvazyan? Now, the guy comes forward in 1998, learns about all the stuff that's happening uh, in, in uni universities in the United States. So he publishes a book, uh, History of Armenia, as presented in American historiography. In other words, he got the idea, okay, uh, United States universities are falsifying Armenian history, and these professors with excellent accolades, excellent accolades, I have researched them all. They got awards and, and, and trophies and all that for doing the, the great job that they do. Now, one thing about uh, professors who falsify, there are a lot of things that they say that is true. So we're not discounting the person himself or herself. But it's also very important for them to acknowledge that uh, you don't need to be an expert. In th that's the other thing I want to mention. Uh, if you need a spinal surgery, yes, you go to a spinal surgeon. But when it comes to history and comparative language, we have different opinions and we need to examine those things. So you really don't need a doctorate in history or language for you to examine history and language. It's unnecessary. Th that's how they kind of uh, avoid you from examining certain things because you think that you need to go to school for it. No, you don't. You can read it yourself. There is no mystery. Whatever the professors have read, you can read. There is no special database that uh, you, you need to put a, a, you know, a pin number in uh, just because you're a professor because you have that data only. No. Each and every one of us can read the same things. And they pretend that we don't know what they're reading. In other words, uh, if they write something and they're, they're experts, then we have to take their word for it. And the thing is, here's what interesting that, that they do. They use each other's material. One falsifier gives the data to another falsifier. So now they're sharing books of the same thing. So they say the same thing in a different way. That's why when I published my 2014 book, I asked the audience and the readers for them to read my references first before you go read the book. Because at least now you have all that information for you to examine my data. That's how you do it. That's how uh, you know, uh, the professor does to its students. You allow them to think on their own. Four years later, after it's published, let me uh, retract for a second. Now, when, when the guy publishes this, okay, uh, whatever culture you are, try to think the same way. Vietnamese, Chinese, Japanese, okay. Uh, 
when, when you're reading something and you're publishing something, you need to make sure that it's available to everybody. But this guy publishes this and, and uh, nobody really read it. Uh, it. It's collecting dust, you know, maybe a few hundred people who know about him, right? But it was never published. It was not massively published. So not th these type of important things are not being funded. I mean, where are our millionaires and billionaires? Where are they? The woods are burning. Nobody is coming to the rescue. All this today was done by with our own capital, okay? Nobody helped, even though it was going around. In other words, what I was saying is our strife is our inter internal battle. We try to do it as much as we can to bring this information to light. But all the other nonsense, all of a sudden, get these all these grants and awards and being funded, and it, it deludes people even further. So we have a huge problem. We have an intellectual war happening and nobody's paying attention. All right, so four years ago, uh, four years after, a guy from UCLA decides to do a rebuttal. Uh, he's from UCLA, I don't know if you know him or not, but it doesn't matter. So, as you can see, you know, he has good accolades. I'm not discounting the guy. You know, it's, I'm sure he read a lot. But I read what he read, all the books that he's published, I have, I have read the references, so uh, he, uh, there's nothing special. It's the way we examine things that changes everything, right? So he uses that book that I showed you that was falsifying information as a tool for him to do a rebuttal of Ivar's Jans. Are you following me? Okay. He is using a, a book that's falsifying Armenian history as a defense against the guy who's saying about what's being falsified, okay? You see the, the circular thing now? They're helping each other. Now, this is a quote from that book. You gotta follow me on this one. That book says that, uh, in other words, he is trying to falsify by uh, by reeling a confirmation bias statement saying that in the future, if they kind of uh, criticize my book, it mostly has to do with nationalism and narcissism. So be careful, guys. If somebody from the future comes, you know, like the uh, Back to the Future movie, like the warning, they're either narcissists or nationalists. That's it. It's a university book, obviously it has value, right? It's not a pamphlet. It was published already. So that carries some weight. So we are at a disadvantage already, even after the publication. Now, <clears throat> that t uh, the, the title of the paper, I hope he's also paying attention. I'm sure he's, he's looking at me right now, hopefully. It was called The Treason of the Intellectuals, a Reflection on the Uses of Revisionism and Nationalism in Armenian Historiography. He already starts with that title saying that whatever I'm going to say has to do with why Armenians are so nationalistic and so narcissistic that they go against all these professors who have university titles. It's very fallacious as you can see. It's, it's, it's all a fallacy. It's, it's and I'm very passionate about these things so I'm sorry if I'm too serious but it's a serious problem. <coughs> Quote from the book, uh, paper, by the way. Oh, uh, at, the end, at the end, you can have my email. I can send you all the references that I'm talking about, okay? So don't, don't worry about missing it. You'll have the slides and the references. Okay. Uh, he is talking about the book that Ivaizan wrote. Here's a quote. It, it constantly misrepresents, misrepresents the views of the authors adversaries often by deliberately distorting passages out of their context. Pay attention to that, okay? Out of context. It's intimidating tactics of branding Western scholars. He means him. Armenia as national traitors and its uh, insinuations that they are paid foreign agents as poor and dangerous substitutes for scholarly thinking. So basically he's saying that I'm not a paid agent 
so uh, kind of stop offending me. I'm from UCLA, I'm gonna write this. Ivy Zan's targets here include Robert Thompson, Nina Garsoyan, James Russell, Levon, as specialists of classical and medieval Armenian history. These are the same people that are falsifying history. He's saying don't, don't uh, criticize them, they're experts. They're not experts of ancient history at all, at all. They have no idea what ancient, uh, ancient history is. Okay, so in short, basically it's saying it's dangerous and everything else. Now, this is from that book that I told you about, Ararat. Read it again. The proto-Armenians migrated into eastern Anatolia, the Armenian Highlands, in other words, uh, and they might mingled with indigenous people. In what way, in what way is this out of context, if I'm criticizing this? If somebody wrote this, that they're invaders to their own land, is there a different way of uh, misinterpreting this? No, right? It, they say exactly what they mean. So if the guy from UCLA is saying that we are wrong in uh, criticizing these people because it's out of context, this is not out of context. They, they mean exactly what, what they mean here. So his, his arguments are already flawed. But he hopes that nobody pays attention to this stuff. See? Ayvazan is in Armenia, published in, in few documents in Armenia. Nobody reads it. But this guy's in the UCLA has a lot of audience, so guess who won? Those who didn't read this. And, of course, having students, you know, do you dis dis disseminate all this stuff? So, basically, now we have another problem. And they're helping each other. Whether they like it or not, they're going to help each other because now it's us versus them now, you see? Several years ago, contrary to what they're saying of the, the migration and uh, invasion, invasion, what, 2,600 years ago? That's what they mean. In other words, Armenians went to their own lands 2,600 years ago. You're going to love the rest of the slides, by the way. It's very exciting. <coughs> so they did this study by a bunch of incredible people from universities and, and g genetics departments all across the world. Look what they had. So the Institute of Molecular Biology, uh, Biology uh, Center for Geogenetics, Armenian DNA Project, all these uh, centers came together to figure out about the Armenian genetics. Now, don't you think there's something special that they're concentrating on Armenian genetics? Okay, if, if we're so insignificant, why so much of a study about our genetics? I don't understand. Okay, red flag. Why spend so much money on Armenian genetics? Who cares, right? They were migrated. I mean, they're already gone anyway. Okay, uh, let, let's read it together. This is one of their uh, points of the study. So we focus on solving a long-standing puzzle regarding Armenian genetics, or it's still a puzzle. I don't know why it's a puzzle, but you know they have to write puzzle. Although the Balkan hypothesis, Balkan hypothesis meaning from the Balkans they came down, okay? I don't know what they're teeter tattering around that one, has long been considered the most plausible narrative on the origin of the Armenians. Remember when they said they migrated? So that's what they mean, they migrated from the Balkans, okay? Uh, our results strongly rejected. They reject it. Now, this is a genetic study. Uh, on the bottom there, uh, modern and ancient samples from the Balkans appear significantly distant from Armenian cluster. In other words, there is no relation or very small relation. Okay, this is Robert Ellis 120 years ago. 140, 140 years ago. Just by comparative linguistics alone. He needed genetics, he didn't need archaeogenetics or anything like that. His examination, 
in a book called The Armenian Origins of Etruscans, and Etruscans were ancestors of the Romans, right? And the Romans were ancestors of Italians. Or, so he said that the Armenians, like the, the Celts, pay attention, are now few in number. They belong once to a longer extent of a country where they spread westward from Armenia to Italy under the names of Phrygians, Thracians, Pelasgians, Etruscans, and also spread to other locations. Very simple. We, we kind of uh, test this and, and, and we come to the same conclusion now with genetics. It's the same thing. Now, how the hell did he just do with comparative linguistics? Because language is a fingerprint, never fades away. Uh, same with other languages. Uh, if you examine it, you will know whether the language is yours, whether they took that word, or you, you got it from elsewhere, it's yours. Same thing with this one. Armenian language is a fingerprint. Not only is it a fingerprint, it actually contains a lot of data in one single word. You can describe the universe in one word. Okay, here's another article from 2017 in current biology article. So they wouldn't say it's, it's not scientific. And uh, lately we know what science means, right? All that we learned the sci uh, we heard the scientists and now it's a huge problem when it comes to COVID. So anyway, uh, the analysis of uh, mitochondrial ancient DNA, basically it's saying that the Urartian cla uh, classical and medieval Armenian skeletons have revealed that modern Armenians have the least genetic distance to them compared to the neighboring people. Another confirmation. He also says that the Armenians are also one of the uh, genetic isolates of the Near East. Near East is the same thing as ancient Armenia. Same thing. Who share affinity with the Neolithic farmers who expanded into Europe beginning around 8,000 years ago. Well, the, the Neolithic revolution happened in Armenia, didn't it? Agriculture, animal domestication. There you go. Very simple. Something like this is not in a textbook. So another red flag. James Russell, you know him. Uh, from Harvard University, a Jewish American trying to learn Armenian. Uh, his uh, doctoral dissertation was about uh, Zoroastrianism in Armenia. Armenians were never Zoroastrian. Armenians were Mithraic. Armenians never worshipped the fire. They understood the light. There's a difference. So, of course, you know, he has incredible accolades. I'm not discounting that. Um, basically, he's saying that the Armenian population crossed from southern eastern Europe into Anatolia in the middle of the second millennium BC as colonists. Now we're colonists. We were invaders now. Now we're colonists. And by moving farthest eastward, they took their ethnic name from the Hattian people whose state they overran. He's confusing Hattian with Hittite. Uh, but it doesn't matter. As, as you can see, it's very asinine. But nobody is paying attention. He's from Harvard. A lot of accolades. If, if we don't pay attention, uh, it's going to be a runaway train anyway. Remember that interview? Uh, well, we, and uh, he was so embarrassed that uh, we were confronted saying that you're falsifying history and he couldn't even speak. He was all red and, and sweaty. Okay, another quote. Now we're wanderers. After wondering, you know, I like their vocabulary, you know, Vaughn. After wandering for nearly 600 years, you know, uh, Moses 40 years, us 600 years, I don't know. Um, from Bosphorus to central Anatolia, they, Armenians, finally found their rest. Fi thank goodness, we finally found. Man. 
um, in the plains of Mount Ararat and call their national homeland. Great. Have you read this book? Have you seen this book in Armenian uh, bookstores? I have. It's still being sold. Nobody's reading it. Now, one point I want to make. <clears throat> if one sentence is wrong and the rest is right, uh, the entire book is not a bad book. I mean, uh, they can talk about the genocide and everything else that is true. But if you're talking about somebody's foundation that is, you know, wrong, then the entire thing is, is faulty. Uh, you know, imagine, let's say, you're, you're Irish, and then I say, well, your both parents were Japanese. They migrated. And then I talk about the, the truthful things. You see, they, they kind of blend two things in, and hopefully you don't notice. It's, it's, very, it's very easy to do, especially if you don't know any better. And I don't blame people because we're so busy with all the things that we do, gas prices, COVID, uh, I don't know, interest rates, career. But at the same time, uh, in the background, your history is being destroyed, erased. And, uh, and then you come to a point where you have completely been disappeared from the maps. And then who needs the Bentleys and everything else that you're trying to work for? Now, Armenia already has been being mentioned thousands of years ago, way before that. Uh, Akkadians did it, Assyrians did it, uh, Sumerians did it. The Sumerians even told the world that our, our ancient homeland is in Armenia. We'll get to that, but um, Peter Kawi, another guy. I'm not going to concentrate too much on him because it's going to be another kind of a same indication of what he says. Uh, Armenian National Epic, uh, Their Devils of Sasun, was a later Armenian version of the Persian Rostam Zal. Uh, I mean, I could only imagine what Arthur Armin would think if, you know, when he read, read this. So in other words, uh, whatever is, is true, they put it in reverse. Whatever is yours, you got it from others. That's their tactic. I mean, who the hell read Rostam Zal anyway? So he can say whatever he wants. Nina Garsoyan, uh, I'm not sure whether she's alive. Uh, that I couldn't verify. But uh, I think she's about 200 now. But the Yerevan Duni dynasty was not Armenian. A very subtle sentence, but it really destroys everything. It destroys your essence altogether. Okay, now we have Kavukjan, who can say otherwise. Uh, I'll talk about Kavukjan uh, later a little bit, but he's saying no, saying no. The Armenian kingdom of Armenia, of the Yerevan Dunis, Yerevan Dunis, the same thing, was the direct continuation of Urartu without any ethnic changes within the royalty. Now, why would I ch uh, choose this over this? without being biased. In other words, let's not be biased here. Uh, we came, you know, let's say from another country, we don't know Armenians and uh, uh, we don't know any, anybody and we're reading this stuff. You know, obviously you have to do your research, but the thing is nobody has time to do the research. So if you're going to school as a student, uh, you just, you need to get that degree so you can get the hell out of there. But the curriculum is formed by the, the heads of the university for them to teach exactly what they want to be, to be taught. Uh, it's an agenda. That's why it's a curriculum. It's an agenda. You have to follow that. Even as a professor, there are certain things you cannot say. As much as you want, as much as you disagree, you cannot say it because the university pays your salary. So it's very easy for a group an interest group for them to come in to try to falsify things. They can pay, per, oh, what, how much is the professor making now? I don't know, 80, 90,000 probably in their 70s. Uh, a falsifying group comes and says, listen, we'll give you a million dollars. Can you just write the sentence? Sure. So those things happen, ladies and gentlemen. Same thing that happens in, in, in politics. 
if uh, you know if enough money comes in, sure, I'll write that law. Now this is a Oxford handbook of ancient Anatolia. They have a they have a page that says Urartian and the Urartians. They never it never happened. They talk about people that never have that never existed basically because that title right there is saying that they're talking about people that have nothing to do with Armenians. And uh, this is a book that's very difficult to get. It's volume one by Richard Tovanisian's uh, edition. And uh, all those people that I showed you, they're in there uh, with a lot of falsified information. He went all the way to Armenia to beg for people not to kind of tarnish his image because he said, uh, and the person was recording on a video saying that this book that is being taught in UCLA is not a historical book. He was caught by a phone call, uh, uh, conversation and then they recorded it. It's on YouTube, by the way. Are you guys okay so far? Uh, I want to I wanna read something in Armenian. And you don't need to know I mean, who it is, but I can give you the reference. Uh, again, I'm not pointing fingers. Uh, uh, Tuan, I'll, I'll read it in, in Armenian, but you know, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It's pretty bad, but uh, basically saying that uh, the word "r" has nothing to do with Armenians. Uh, can you read in the back? Okay, I'll g I'm going to give you a second for you to read it. We're good. And uh, if you don't mind reading this one, if, if you could. Okay. Uh, now, if 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 an Armenian is publishing something like this to his students, uh, it, it's a bigger problem uh, because it, it's it's an internal problem, and uh, it can be hidden amongst you know it all. So uh, may, people will pay attention. Uh, this creates a lot of uh, enemies, uh, especially those who don't disagree, because a professor said it. He has a he has his cult. So the students are going to defend the professor, and now you have hate. So falsification of information is hate speech. I'm sure you agree, Tom. Uh, not only it's hate speech, it's defamation. Two things. Uh, Israel is pretty good. They have anti-defamation league. Do Armenians have no? We don't have international attorneys defending. Uh, you know, defamation and falsifications, do we? I don't know, an attorney. Big problem. And uh, it's even bigger problem when you have people that have no history pretend that they do, and they try to protect that history. But people who have history is being falsified, and there's nobody there at the gate. Okay, now the, the slides were saying that uh, the, the God R has nothing to do with Armenians. Uh, oh, one thing about clarification since we're on the video. Uh, the word Aryan has to do with the ethno-linguistic group. Uh, it has nothing to do with Hitler or Nazi and all that. It's a designation of people, okay? Uh, get that straight and, and, and I hope the world understands that when we talk about an ethno-linguistic group, we're talking about their culture and heritage. We have nothing to do with World War II. Uh, so, basically saying that, you know, the word Aryan came out of Armenia. 
And, and the thing is that word can only be described in Armenian. You know, the etymological root is in the Armenian language. Ar Armenians have more than 10,000 words that either starts with R, in the middle R, and then ends with R. And all of a sudden, we have nothing to do with R. And R is a verb, by the way, and uh, it's very important. The Armenian language is a functional language. It describes the world. It tells you what's happening. And the function of it all, and uh, within the universe and within the, the natural world, the Armenian language is a functional descriptive cipher. In one Armenian word, uh, there is more data than in a big flash drive. It's very economical, by the way. Okay, uh, Robert Ellis, the language of the Etruscans was Aryan of the Armenian Forum. We have another guy who's saying the same thing. So now, besides from Armenians being detached from their own land, same thing with the Native Americans, by the way, they use the word Indian. There's a reason why they were using the word Indian by the federal government, because when the time comes, they can always say you were a newcomer anyway from India or from Asia, so we need those lands. Say so same thing with this. Armenians are being detached from their lands because you're migrated and you're an invader. Now, the, not, not only are they detaching themselves as people, now their language has nothing to do with them. So now all of a sudden you're just a nomad who are wandering and, uh, and you found a resting place and the, the language you speak has nothing to do with you. Uh, Simon Payaslan, another guy. Uh, uh, again, uh, this is just an example from a historical book. You know, I'm, I'm sure he's a nice guy. Okay, history of Armenia. I have that book too. Uh, you know, get a copy. It's a good idea to get copies of these books. You know, whether it's they have falsified information or not, it's still a valuable thing. It's a book. Uh, he has a page on Urartians, and uh, he says that the Urartians. When he says the Urartians, the, he already is saying that you could, uh, first there were Urartians, then there were Armenians. It's like it's the same people. Uh, the Urartians had their own indigenous culture and language, which were mixed. Now we're mixed with uh, Hurrians and Hittites and Aramaic and Assyrian influences, and then the combination of these cultures and languages set the foundation for the Armenian culture and language, although the latter is of Indo-European origin. He has one thing right. Uh, Armenian is, it is of Indo-European, uh, and the word actually Indo-European was called Aryan before, and then when World War II came, they didn't want to kind of offend anybody, so they turned into Indo-European. So, uh, Tuan, this is something that also is important because when you have these discussions, and you talk about you know uh, Aryan language and all that, it's not really to talk about Hitler at all. It's, it's about the language itself which he was confused anyway. Uh, but uh, the historical books say another thing, that the, uh, the Atahurians did not disappear from history away, away to the north in their homeland, Armenian homeland, that they went. They uh, entrenched themselves and built up the kingdom of Urartu. So the Hurrians, the Armenians are the same. Urartians, Armenians are the same. It's the same people in a different way of saying things. Now, uh, another quote. Hurrians were from Armenia. It's very simple. Yeah, obviously. Because the word Hurrian hur, hur is an Armenian word. So once you say it's an Armenian word, then they start attacking it. That has nothing to do with you. You see, they always are trying to follow a way for you to get detached from your language. What is this? How do you say in Armenian? Uh, I, w I was talking about the uh, Hurrian, so, no, Hrahan, uh, 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 so Hurj means fire, so you, you take the fire out, remember the, the, the Armenian language being a descriptive language, Hrahan, uh, what is this, Hrahan, uh, in other words, a fire disseminator. Tanomas. Tan. Tight. 
Oh. Where's this? Hurtir. See, it has to do with fire. You say three words, that's to do with fire, and then the, the argument's already done. You can prove now that no, because nobody else has this uh, etymology in their language. The, the, the game is over. See, two slides is enough. Uh, Museum of Anatolian Civilization. Uh, it's very big. Uh, it's in Turkey, and uh, it has a lot of stuff there that they preserve. Remember the map of the big Armenian uh, territory before? Now, can you imagine now in current day how much land has been lost and how much that they find that never tell the Armenians what they have found? So all that they find, that goes into the museum and not a single word Armenian is mentioned in the entire museum or its entire description. Yes, they preserve it, but they don't talk about it at all because they need to, you know, remove you from, from history altogether. Now, they go all the way to 8000 BC, you know, you have the Paleolithic and the Paleolithic and Athletic. Early Bronze, Assyrian, Hittite, uh, Phrygian, Late Hittite, Urartian, Lydian, Classical period. So can you imagine all that was in that region? Here's another proof. So that region had all the stuff that we're connected with, but uh, incidentally, now it's in Turkey, so they need to do this. In other words, now they're creating their own history to make a fact that they were there and Armenians will... Now you see how bad it is? Now on one side, you have Armenians being migrated there and they're wanderers. On the other side, Turkey is uh, publicizing all this without telling about the Armenians. So now we have two battles going on and uh, and we're worried about you know uh, gas prices but now Robert Ellis remember the words Lydian and Phrygians and all that well Robert Ellis said uh, uh, Herodotus and Audoxus have class, uh, classed Phrygians and Armenians together and so do I and linking Phrygians uh, Mysians, Lydians, Carians and Pelasgians with the Greek is erroneous and admissible. Uh, they rather need to be linked to the Armenians. So all those uh, periods that the, the museum covers, basically Robert Ellis already said that those are those the same people with a different uh, representation in history. So it, it all needs to say Armenian Lydian, Armenian Pelasgian, Armenian, you see, it has to be mentioned, otherwise you, you disappear. Robert Ellis, Armenian conquest of Europe were during prehistoric and pre-traditional times. This is one of the key quotes that he made and many people don't really realize the repercussions of this quote. He's basically saying that those people, the, the Armenian Highlanders, went all over Europe during pre-traditional times. There was no record at those times. So obviously we don't have that habit, you know. Uh, they didn't have the capability of, uh, you know, posting something on Facebook and they didn't need to take photos of everything that they eat. You know what I'm saying? Uh, for them it's a normal course of life. So obviously there has to be a gap in, in records, but it doesn't mean that they weren't there. And we can test it that they were there by language, genetics and so forth. But language is key. Now the Etruscan... Uh, if you compare the languages of some of the words, and uh, by the way, I have tested this, so if somebody comes and says, no, no it's not true, yes, it is. Uh, just because a word alters just a bit doesn't mean that, you know, we, we, see, this is written in English, so never mind the, the letters themselves. It could have been pronounced a different way, but the idea stays the same. So whatever is in Truscan, those words are the same thing in Armenian. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the point of what I mean by doing these comparisons so you'll see uh, why this is important. Uh, have you heard of uh, Vladimir Levenstein before? Uh, uh, he's an information theorist or was an information theorist and uh, he found a way for him to figure out how two things relate by a mathematical formula. And this is the formula, don't panic. Uh, 
we're not doing you know statistics or mathematics I just want to show you the formula and I'm gonna break it down what he means <coughs> he's saying that if you compare two words uh, you would know how many uh, changes you gotta do between those languages for them to sound the same thing so let's say um, I'm just going to read the definition about, basically, it, it also includes insertions, deletions, and substitutions of the letters. And I have an example, so you'll figure out what I'm talking about. So let's say, let's say the word ara in Armenian and then ra in Egyptian. Ara or ar is the Armenian god and then ra is the Egyptian god. In, in reverse. Uh, so if we use the Levenstein score, what do you think it will be? between let's say one to five for example the score would be one because we only need to add an A to make it Ara in Egyptian so according to the Levishan distance formula uh, the lower the number the closer the thing it is to one another but we're not just dealing with the way it looks like we also need to also compare whether they're the same thing in other words they sound the same thing and they mean the same thing Th that's that's key, but Levishine's distance did not include in the formula. It was just had to do with the comparison. But uh, when he did the examination of languages, the Levishine distance formula proved or showed or concluded that the Armenian language is the closest to the mother tongue of all Indo-European languages. So if you take, let's say, a mother tongue and you compare it to all the Indo-European languages, uh, the the Armenian is the closest to the mother tongue okay now we have statistics involved as far as examining a few words you have seen this map before or, or the tree it kind of is the same thing it it talks about how you know mother tongue sprung and then all the rest of the branches as you can see uh, the uh, Ariano Greco Armenic is at the bottom here and I'll show you why this should be this. Okay, I'll, I'll explain why. Because when you're a linguist, uh, by the way, Indo-European studies started in, in Europe, uh, and some British dudes saw similarities between Sanskrit and, and Greek. They got excited, and they started to examine them uh, with no people inside that actually spoke the language, you see? It's a runaway train again. Whatever they published, and also at that time uh, you were funded to publish uh, by a funding source. So your book had authority over a person who didn't publish anything, right? So now we're kind of trying to re-examine all those things, and and there, this is the problem when you have comparative linguists. They take all that in the curriculum, and then they study, and now all the comparative linguistic professors say the same thing over and over again. Because why? Because it was written over there why even change things around it's, it's problematic so a little bit closer you know you have uh, Ariano Greco you have the the, the Balto and of course it goes to uh, Luian, Lydian and Hittite over here and then Greek over here so basically the Armenian Greek were very close and then Greek this Greek went this way and then Armeno Aryan they still call it Armeno Aryan they still call it that because you can get away uh, from not doing it uh, this is uh, in the early 19th century uh, and I'll send the references too so basically it says it is certain that there was a, a prime evil speech in other words a mother tongue called at the present by scholars the Aryan tongue uh, at that time they were okay saying these words so uh, that it was once spoken by the people who lived in the high uh, tablelands of Armenia and Iran. That it was uh, carried to Europe by the inhabitants who uh, emigrated from the land now ruled by the Shah, that Greek, Latin, Celtic, and Irish. Anyway. So basically, he's saying that, okay, it was Aryan language, it was called this, and then it was born between Armenia and Iran. Now we're getting somewhere. Now we can pinpoint where we're going to. Uh, there is, in, in other words, uh, there is no Proto-Indo-European language. Uh, it's just a, a 
hypothetical language mother tongue. So for you as a linguist, linguist uh, you need to just be careful and, and say, okay, there was this one, say, mother tongue, and, uh, and then everything else came through it. So it doesn't matter as long as you, know, you say that and you're careful. Now, how do you say this in Armenian? Tits. Uh, if I if I take the word tets, uh this is tets. Uh Titer is different. Uh, titer doesn't have hair. Uh, this is tets. Now, uh, the word for moth is tets, and even though Sumerian, Basque, and Armenian are are said to be different, all three say the same thing. And I have verified this, by the way, by the sumerologist and the boscologist. Yeah, uh, they, they say the same thing. But if you go around and try to examine all that, uh, they're going to say they're unrelated. So uh, we have to stop saying things are unrelated. We, we need to examine things. Well, what happened was uh, Gianfranco Forni, who I spoke with, decided to examine Basque as an Indo-European language, even though they say it's not. It certainly is. Uh, I wrote a book on it, but uh, anyway. Uh, another quote, the Indo-Germanism decreased the significance of the ties of Iberians, Basque, and Armenian to their Aryan roots. So we already have uh, conversations that Armenians and Basque and all that they were all interconnected and then they were Indo-European also. Uh, if you want to learn more about the uh, Armenian origins of Basque, uh, this was published several years ago and this was an attempt for me to resurrect Bahan Sarkisian's extraordinary work. Nobody else has done it. It's the only b book in the English language that talks about this. And uh, this is now at the University of uh, Las Vegas Library. And I published this in 2017. So far, no rebuttals, no refutations. It's not going to happen. When it comes to my projects, uh, I always do my homework before I publish. It's not going to happen. They're not going to be refuted. So, uh, diamond, uh, how do you weigh it? Karat. If you examine the word karat in any language, uh, you don't find the root word. You can't find it. You can try it too, okay? Don't take my word for it. Try it. Now, we have two possible explanations for ka karat. Either we can say that kaj hatik, because they used to, uh, remember, they used to weigh certain, and you put a rock on one side and then the item on the other, kaj hatik. Or, we can also say that uh, it's gari hatik because gari was uh, barley and uh, it was very valuable as far as for weighing certain things. So the use of barley was able to kind of figure out what the, the weight would be. So we already have an answer right there as far as weighing something at karat. So karhat turn into karat. Now you're talking about, you know, several thousands of years ago. Obviously, you know, the pronunciation changes, the use changes, but you see the, the, the essence stays the same. And if we don't talk about this, it's going to disappear. Let's take the word enough. Uh, it also means full. So I had enough, I'm full. Uh, if you examine the word enough, you're going to be going through a rabbit's hole. It's a disaster. Everybody says one thing. No, it's, uh, you know, Albanian. Uh, you know, it's German, it's, it's English, it's French, and all that. It's, it's this kind of a mess. And uh, see, the thing is, the comparative linguists take pride in all this because they took their time in examining all this. Yeah. Albanian. And, and, and as you can see, the further it goes down, uh, the, uh, the meaning, uh, the cognate goes away, the meaning goes away, but they're proud of themselves because they have spent so much time on it. Let's just publish this. That's what it means. Who, who the hell uh, spends time in trying to figure out whether that linguist or comparative linguist 
uh, wrote the wrong etymology of that. Nobody does it. But it's the essence. It's the essence. We're trying to save people. If we need to go down that, that deep, we have to do it. We have to save the people that way. Now, Panav, Panav is the same thing as being had enough. Leovin. So enough is banav. Very simple. Over there they're fighting. No, it's ours, it's ours, and we're sitting like that. Enough is banav. Now, yes, it changes the way you pronounce it, but you know, the essence is the same. You really don't need to, because now it says, uh, it says the same thing and also means the same thing. Those two tests. Uh, murder, the word murder, um, I just took it from one of the uh, historical linguistics and uh, they say that uh, it's proto in European mer. How do you say to die in Armenian? Yeah, but it says proto Indo European. They could easily say Armenian because it's the only in Armenian that is closest to the proto European, and I think that proto Indo European is the Armenian itself. That's why we see. Again, you know, we, we make this face when they fight over and then we know the answer, you know, we're just looking at So, that's what I mean. This should be here. Because if you examine the Proto-Indo-European uh, root words, they're all Armenian. We don't really don't need to kind of uh, create an extraordinary layer. There is no need. But there is a need if they want to hide something and, and it's, it's, it's happening, so we, we can see it now. Let's see. Uh, Armenian churches, uh, beautiful architecture. And, you know, we, we have one of the finest and one of the oldest. And this is typically an Armenian architecture. You can't say it's not. You can't say it's not, even if you try to, it, not, unless they keep saying it's not. First, you know, this is part of ancient Armenia in, you know, Ani and so forth. So it's being destroyed, obviously. Nobody's paying attention. Uh, that's why I'm involved with, uh, with my complaints to uh, UNESCO, uh, because they really need to pay attention. But, you know, since I'm part of government now, I want to stress the importance of that. So uh, in, in Georgia, they would take this and then they would kind of shave it, uh, remove all the Armenian markings, and then write something in Georgian, and it becomes Georgian. Uh, to a point where there is another one, or the Khachkars in Nakhijevan, remember? Uh, and then you have uh, destruction happening. Uh, by Zeres, why why would you destroy an ancient culture's relics if you're not trying to hide something? Why? I mean, it, it's actually it's a privilege to find something. To so how can you call it your own lands when you're destroying what's on those lands? I mean, beyond that, what what else is there? Whatever. The more you de uh, go deeper into the into the hole, the more Armenian you're gonna find. So. However you look at it, you, know, you are going to unearth uh, an ancient civilization. If we don't pay attention, the Armenian churches become Georgia's churches. Uh, do you realize how bad this is? Now, whether you're religious or not, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is a, one of the uh, architectural review, by the way. Many people go here for advice and so forth. It's a very reputable site. They call it Georgia because nobody's paying attention. Of course. Why not? If the goal doesn't mean anything to you, you're not paying attention, another person is going to come and get it, period. And Armenian history is laced with gold. If you don't pay attention, they're going to take it. You know, all the stuff that's 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 showing. Uh, there was a photo. They call that Georgian, by the way. And then there's this uh, the hexagon there. You see there. 
Okay. Uh, Armenians were the first to use it way before uh, it was adopted uh, by, by Israel and the, and the Jews, way before, thousands of years before. We just never paid attention. Because this can be found all in Armenia, including 5,000 years ago on a dagger. Okay. That's what happens when we don't pay attention. Uh, the swastika, actually it's a sign of life. Buddhists use it, giants use it, everybody uses it. It's very important. Circle of life, universe, you name it. It's, it's all called that. The, the, the north, east, west, south, north star and its circle. However you call it, we have that. And it was all over Armenia. These are actually were found in Armenia and so forth. And these are the oldest swastikas, go back to, you know, tens and thousands of years, and Armenian petroglyphs, you see? When I talk about abstract writing, this is what I mean. This is very abstract. It's kind of they're trying to write something. And then, of course, you know, it went from Armenia to Buddhism and then into Indian culture, and then it was... So, when Armenians went out there during pre-traditional times, that's what they meant. They take all this with them, nothing is recorded. And then thousands of years later, they're using it. No, it's ours now. Of course. Why would they remember even that somebody took it from there? But we have a source of where it is. This is the oldest thing. And this was all connected to uh, the way they looked at the stars and the galaxies and then the way, the way they imagined how the universe works and so forth. So this is all... Can you imagine uh, 14,000 years ago, there was no light. They were in darkness for eight hours. Can you imagine how beautiful of a poetry they can write if they're under the stars for eight hours? I know this because uh, when they did the, uh, the Native American ceremony, I was in a Hogan. Uh, it started about 10 p.m. and ended at 4 a.m. I was in the dark for six hours by a uh, Navajo uh, prayer for six hours, constant. You know, I had anxiety. It was my first time. You know, you don't know what's happening. But when I went out there and I looked at the stars, I saw galaxies upon galaxies. So that was only eight hours. Imagine constantly you have those people who are examining the stars. That's a reflection of all that. So the Armenian letters are very, very important. Uh, you want to take a break or you're okay? Break? Go. Okay. You're not bored? No, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm, all right. I'm pumped. So Armenian letters 36. Uh, you know, thank you for uh, Messer Mashtots for reintroducing it into the system. Introducing it, reintroducing it. Armenian letters were there a long time, and so I'm going to show you a few things that maybe most of you haven't seen. And of course, you know, uh, good old Hajj uh, with his. With this examination of the petroglyphs, you know, you, you go from 15,000 of the animals that you saw, the pet, all this is in Sunik and Uhtazar and Jermasur mountains, all that. And then eventually it turns into kind of art, and then eventually the alphabets, and then uh, the, the current form that we have. So he, he saw the progression. And of course, closer, this is closer to to this, you know, I'm trying to find a good copy, so I had the best copy if I could. So he basically said that 15,000 years you had the petroglyphs, and then now in the Neolithic, and then eventually uh, into Mesoropian, starting 406. Uh, this is another book. Uh, this is an Armenian book, and, and there are many Armenian books in Armenia that's collecting dust. I always emphasize this. We have extraordinary books out there, but it's never being published in English. Might as well just not even publish anything at all. Who's going to know? Nobody reads it. That's why I'm doing this presentation in English. Yes, it's with an accent, but yes, I'm doing it in English because the world needs to know. The world needs to know.
By saving Armenian history, we're saving world history because we're allowing others to use this mechanism for them to protect their own culture from falsification and disinformation. This is relevant to all. That's why the languages of Frankenprit was very welcome in India and in Ireland because they saw their roots of Armenianism at the same time how the world was connected. You see, they look at it differently. Uh, you remember him? Veltman? Some of you know him. Maybe most of you don't. Uh, he was a Canadian historian. And uh, we used to speak before he died from COVID. Or, you know, if you, you, you don't have to believe that it was COVID, but uh, the records say you died of COVID. And uh, we used to talk as far as, I mean, this is his latest last photo before he died. Uh, he was very knowledgeable in ancient alphabets. He examined all of them. Uh, uh, his book is available, by the way. You can buy from London, and then they can ship it to you. It's a good idea to have it. The, the Armenian alphabet is, 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 is key in there. And he actually examined also uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, geometrical works. So he was kind of all over the place. But you know, he was very, very knowledgeable, very sincere, very nice guy. Uh, So he said the Armenian alphabet is 17,000 years old. That changes things. If you have an alphabet 17,000 years, then you have your language going back 45,000 years. That's why Heruni said that. You want to see his lecture for a few minutes? See him saying that? Here we go, 2013. Sorry about that. Huh? He said what I what he said over there. I just wanted to hear it from from him. I'll try one more time, but if not, I'll send it to you. It's too bad it doesn't show. And I spent a lot of time on it too, you know, just to show you. It's too bad. I know, right? Uh, so believe me, he said that. <laughs> and uh, definitely. So when he said 17,000 years, uh, and then the guy up front goes, oh, excuse me, sir, did you say what? He says, yes, 17,000 years ago, 17,000. Uh, it was a very interesting conversation, just that. I mean, the, the, I'm sure it was a shocker all over. I mean, uh, he's a reputable guy. He examines all the alphabets that I've seen. Why would he say it's 17,000 years? Because he can connect to the petroglyphs of the Armenian highlands. Now, uh, uh, the guy is brave enough to do it, which I'm glad. And of course, you know, uh, our gigantic Paris Heruni, astrophysicist uh, he was really an extraordinary man and uh, and his book actually uh, should be read by all it's in Armenian and, and English at the same time I, I I wanted to have another copy in English I think I got it for hundred and thirty dollars in April books very expensive but it's worth having it at least I can give it to my son so uh, he, he he does talk about you know 
Armenian language spring about 45,000 years ago going down. Yeah, the, all these uh, letters right here are all part of the petroglyphs and hieroglyphs in Armenia. So uh, Mashtots didn't invent anything. Uh, you can't invent something where you need language and literature for it to give it to the next generation to come. They need to uh, architecture and knowledge and all that. You need to tell them. You need to write it down. Uh, this is a 1883-84 uh, 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 photo uh, of a Armenian priest, and they have the Urartian uh, script and the Armenian script next to each other on a on the cross stone. And the reason why I'm, I'm emphasizing this, I personally believe that Armenian alphabet, the way we write today, existed the same time that the uh, Araratian script was like this. This was for more internal secret communication. This was for out there on the, on the, on the caves. Because yeah, this was a secretive language, had a lot of information on it. I'm sure we have lost the cipher. We have lost so much. After the destruction, when Christianity came, they destroyed everything, they killed everybody, all the libraries and books and everything else, and then 100 years of darkness, and then all of a sudden we have churches and we have priests. So we're missing 100 years of darkness. A lot of things can happen. Memory can be faded. If you want to destroy a generation or people, just kill them by four generations. They're never going to know what happened in 100 years. Never. You don't even think that something happened, you see? It's all gone. So when they say, you know, truth always reveals itself under the sun one day, that's not true. If it's destroyed and evaporated, the truth will never come back. You know, this is uh, Urartian, and as you can see, you know, you have the Armenian letters right here. Hittite. You see this? You see it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something. Uh, this is Portasar. Lion here, lion here, lion here, lion here. That's right. This is 12,000 years. Now, 12,000 years later, you have something like this. Everybody's completing the same thing now with Armenian letters. Another Hittite. Um, I want to show you this before I, I start showing quotes. Uh, people like quotes. Uh, I, I kind of help them out. You don't have to read the entire book. Okay, Hilbrecht, he said, uh, Hittite writing was invented by the forefathers of the modern Armenians. Hitt uh, Hittite. Almost everything we know about the uh, Hittite is old Armenian. Hittites were always uh, represented like modern Armenians in Egyptian monuments by Lushen. Hittite inscriptions require the Armenian language to be understood. Require. You see how much history is being hidden just by you know, not including Hittite as part of the Armenian Association. Armenians reminds us of Hittite in many ways. They cannot be separated. Uh, Mitani. Uh, uh, I do talk about Mitani, but uh, I, I sometimes try to emphasize. Now you see how the slides are connected. I'm jumping all over the place, but it's connected. Uh, you know what the capital of Mitani was? Okay. Who has Bachagan? This one. Only Armenians have Bachagan. And it was the capital of Mitani. Mitun, you mean like one house? Like a consolidated house? Mitanits. Now you see Hurrians over here. We already have covered that, Naidi, Mitani. All this is happening here. All of a sudden, they don't relate to one another. Uh, you know the book. All right, for you. 
and this is Petri's book. He says that Mitanni, Mitanni was Armenian, and then uh, Queen Tai, mother of, of Akhenaten in Egypt, was Armenian. And uh, we recently know that there were genetic studies done that uh, Queen Tai had the closest affinity to Armenians. And even the reconstruction was Armenian face. And uh, I can send you the scientific material too, but yeah. So, you know, you have 150 years ago a person writing something and then we have genetics to prove it. Now even reconstruction. So you see. Uh, this is a page from my book. Uh, I, I kind of wanted to show you this so that way, you know, you'll if you go back to the book, you can see that I write about all this and, and the references pertaining to what we're discussing. Um, because we need to connect all the references for the audience, for the readers, uh, so that way uh, they don't think that we're just quoting or misquoting certain things from certain books. So this is Mitani. The lion and the eagle, we have a lion and eagle in the Armenian, current Armenian symbol. Uh, this is Sumer with the head and that star. This is Tigran the Great with the head and the star. The point is that the Armenian culture had a continuous flow without any disruption. Continuous. It was just different phases with different names and different representations. It's all the same because their symbolism tells us that, the language tells us that. It's the same, they're just really, again, they're not, they don't have to take photos of everything that they do. They, they, they were just living their lives and representing their life through symbology. And that's what they did. Um, a red herring is a, a logical fallacy, something that they do to distract you from something. Have you noticed that they have this, a lot of, uh, how do I put it? As, as Armenian land is getting smaller and smaller, you see the, the neighboring countries wanted to claim more and more. Now they call it their own ancient lands. You heard it, right? That's a red herring. So in other words, we don't need to prove something, but all of a sudden we're in a position of proving because we have so much pressure that we have to prove it, constantly prove it, while another major thing is happening on the other side. That's what's happening. We're proving something we shouldn't, but now we have to because those people that don't relate, and the, the more they uh, say the, 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 the false thing over and over again throughout generations, it's going to become true. Repeat the same thing over and over again, it's going to become true. So that's exactly what's happening right now. And, uh, but at the same time, they're trying more to get lands that, uh, that doesn't belong to them and culture, but we're trying less for us to protect what we got left. It's, it's, it's very paradoxical and it's very concerning. Uh, this is Uh This was uh, the first cathedral built in Armenia when, when Gregory came and uh, put the new faith uh, into the people there. Uh, there was a temple found underneath and obviously all the oldest Armenian churches are built on Armenian old temples. All of them, all the oldest ones at least. And so they had to do it because they need to use the infrastructure. So this was a new addition. This was all under it, it was the same. However, we have, do have evidence that even the old temples thousands of years ago, we did have this. But in essence, yeah, all the way, whatever we had the, uh, the structure, it was used for the new church. Uh, you know, we always call this Quran right in churches, they call Quran. Uh, this is not a Quran where you do your Christian, uh, you know, baptism and so forth, or whatever you do, ceremonies, or, or it, this is not a slab where you kill a bull. They try to tell you that, but it's not. Uh, concentrate, concentrate on the word Quran. Quran means Quranal. It means to go deeper. That means that this had a, had a priest there and he would have the library and a book. He would bring the book and then he would Quranal or go into the depth of the book to give somebody some information. Of, uh, a farmer would come and say, listen, my, my crop has died. What should I do? Wait a minute. He would go get a book, 
it will hold on, it will hold on all into the information, and then this is what's called in ancient times, you know, the temple, Da uh, Charge, meaning to give charge, to find a solution for something, right? So the guy was in Horan, he was giving charge a solution to a problem. Very simple. Our language has all the information, so we have to pay attention. Uh, was that clear on that one, or should I? Okay. El mejor, el Schumer, Armenia. Quranar, yeah, that's right. Uh, the worshippers of Kaldi in Urartu, he means. Uh, came from Armenia. They were the original Celts, a mountain race. Uh, Sarkis Ivaizan actually had a big book uh, that he tried to compare the languages of Urartian and Armenian. And uh, you see, that's another red herring. They're, they're trying to kind of force Armenians to prove something. But unfortunately, there are people in Armenia who think that Urartu has nothing to do with Armenians. And they teach that in the university, by the way, so it's not only here. So uh, with these calculations, uh, you know, you have a lot of words that's similar and the same. <coughs> he proved it already. We don't need to go any further. It's proved. Game is over. We just need to publish and relay this information so new books can come. Unfortunately, we don't have the professors to do it. They don't have the balls to do it. So we've got to do it another way. Uh, ladies, my apologies for that one. Uh, the, the, the Musasij temple or Ardeni temple, it was in Urartu, Armenia, and it was uh, built in 825 BC. And then the Assyrian king was very fond of it, so he brought people over, so they plundered and pillaged it. They took everything away. That's where Assyrians learned about iron. They were using copper and bronze for, uh, for war material, and then they go to Armenia and they, they discover iron. In July of 2014, the long-lost Musasir temple was found, or they think it was found. And after so many years, uh, they think that they found the remnants of Musasir temple. And professor here, Professor uh, Zamwa, sent the data of what was presented at the symposium regarding the new discovery. And this is the Musasi temple that they think that they have found, which is uh, near Lake Urmia. And uh, this is all the things that they found in that temple. Pillars and all that, because uh, they said that a lot of people were just taking things out of there and for thousands of years. You know, you can imagine what happens to something that it's not maintained. This was found in Musasir. You see the goat? This is in... It's the same thing. This is, uh, I don't know, it can be more than 10,000 years old, but what I'm saying is, like, look at the similarity. It's the same thing. Uh, you have this in Hittite, you see this? And you have this in Mexico. Uh, this was uh, the, the carpet that Hitler had it was destroyed by the fire. All these designs, and now you have this. So this into that carpet. I mean, you, you can imagine the, the, the time segment between the two, that this information was relayed. How the hell did that happen? You've been here before? Yeah. Oh. Gerhard was a Mithraic cave before it was turned into a Christian thing. That's why, hence the cave, because Mithra was born out of a cave. That's why all the ancient stuff is in, in the caves. It was built in a cave. So, and they started uh, putting crosses. Obviously, the cross is a very ancient thing for Armenians. It goes back to immemorial times, but it wasn't this way, but we have that. Uh, let me take you closer. 
You see this? Okay, it's the same thing as this. So the symbology already tells you that there is a continuum of information and they had to show it that way. You know, look at the time distance between the two and we have that information. Uh, this is Sumer, you see this? This is uh, Portasar. Okay, Portasar was discovered in 1990s rediscovered in 1990s. This is an old. So this could not have known about this or this about this unless they're connected. Right? They didn't copy each other. Uh, they were just discovering different times. So, uh, and you know what this is called? Uh, Professor Shulman, before he died in 1999, he wanted to examine uh, how things were sounded when he read uh, the Fort Asar carvings and all that. He called this Nav. Without knowing Armenian. So he said Nav without knowing Armenian. Now we have evidence that some of the words that are found there that a German guy not knowing Armenian said Nav, that maybe this is Nav. Something that brought that was brought there. I mean you just come with your conclusions, but I'm just concentrating on and I have his original work, by the way. I asked the family for them to uh, provide me the copy uh, if I need to publish something. So I'm not just the same things. And of course, you know, I just I just showed you this uh, the connection between the Sumerian and that. Can you hear me? Okay. Good. Uh, Nemrut, Komegni times. The symbol right here, we have the Garni symbol, and then we have the, the Mayan symbol. You see right here? You see that? And you see this? It's all the same. <laughs> uh, this is Garni, this is Porta, so. Check, check. Uh, you know, we, we have this thing about big social. Uh, just the idea of height is already there. We don't need to go through all the trouble again. Uh, just because we have a, a Greek suffix doesn't mean the entire race of people will change. Pike, Pike Azuni, is Hyksos. Very simple. Because the Hyksos were uh, also portrayed when they were lighter skin compared to some of the Egyptian counterparts. Uh, this is the Armenian gate and we have it somewhere. So we're, what we're doing is we're just connecting the dots. The more of these associations we have, the more we can find connections to it. So now we're venturing back to Shumer now. Okay. So if we're migrated uh, from elsewhere, how do we find these connections in Shumer? Oh, by the way, uh, several years ago they did a DNA test to see whether the Arabs and the Sumerians were the same in Iraq and uh, who was indigenous and who was not. So they determined from the skeletal remains that the, the, the uh, first of all, Indians from India had nothing to do with Sumer and the Arabs there. And then two, that Sumerians were uh, indigenous to Sumer. In other words, they didn't come from elsewhere. So they're basically talking about their own people. Uh, the majority of Sumerian words were Aryan, Armenian particularly. So this talk about Sumerian not being uh, being an isolate or not being connected to Armenian, well, it's not true because Sumerian is just an Armenian dialect. Very simple. It's always a problem. It's just an Armenian dialect, like any other dialects. And I'm going to... Okay, Armenians have more than 100 dialects. If two dialects talk with one another, you won't, be under, you won't understand them at all. You would think that it's another language. So 
Just because we don't understand that dialect, it doesn't seem, let's say, close to our hearts and our ears, it doesn't mean that it's not our own dialect. It needs an examination. So if two neighboring dialects in Armenia cannot understand each other, how can other dialects that have ventured far away would be understood unless you go deep down into the, the root word of things? I know it's a Friday. I know you need to go home. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it short, OK? Huh? There, there will be part two, yes, if you allow me to. But uh, I need to go home. I know it's a Friday night, so I'll, I'll make it quick. You know, we have uh, all these, uh, you know, the symbology in, in Egypt as far as the, the Ankh all over uh, the Egyptian. Uh, the thing is, the Sumerians had it before. So you see right here, it was already in use before the Egyptians did. And then Ankh, which in Egyptian means, you know, cross of life, for Ankh, or Kyank is life. Um, so it's, it is connected. Doesn't mean that the letter falls off. You got a problem? No, you don't. Uh, it's it's the same. And of course, uh, we have the stars uh, in Nimrod and in uh, Tigran and the Great. We have Sumer. We have here. And as you can see, uh, they're they're kind of trying to tell us something that listen, we're all the same. We're just relaying this information to you. Uh, but somehow all this was lost. We just need to put it together. Uh, so the, the Musa siege, you know, it's, it's around here somewhere in the same vicinity as ancient Armenia, so we can kind of prove that. Uh, when it comes to Armenians, this is the University of Tartu. And uh, basically they're saying that uh, the Great Armenia reached deep into Eastern Anatolia, down to the Mediterranean, many of the historical important places lie around Lake Van. In other words, uh, they're saying that the Armenian uh, geography was much bigger than that. Well, yeah, uh, it was. But I'm just pointing out uh, how, f how far they go as far as universities for them to prove something with we already know. This is not in the historical books that I show you as far as the Armenians, where they came from and all that. They could have included this stuff, but they're not. All right, this is from 1863. Uh, uh, 1863, uh, written by a bishop. This is before the Hamidian massacres, by the way. You see, I'm going to I'm, uh, I'm proving you that uh, before the Armenian genocide, uh, there was much more data as far as their knowledge of how influential the Armenian language was. And then after the genocide came, we fell behind 120 years. In other words, we are missing 120 years of a battle. 120 years. All right. Uh, Let's read it together, okay? Uh, if, if you could, can you just read it? If you can read it. The Armenians were called by other nations Arameans. You know, Aramean is an Armenian word. Uh, Aram. I don't know why they call it Semitic, but it's not. Okay. Uh, Paris Heroni actually read one of the slabs that supposedly Aramaic. This was it. And uh, he was able to uh, very easily read it by even kind of changing some alphabetical order of, of words. And he was able to uh, decipher it in a sense where, you know, Aftashes, uh, that this is my land and this is the kind of uh, the stone to represent that. He's reading it. You know, when, uh, when they say about uh, the Nemrut that has nothing to do with the Armenians, you know, we can actually prove it because uh, the king, Komagni, greeting uh, Mithra, 
he is distinctly wearing an Armenian crown. Very simple. Just because you have Greek letters on it, it doesn't mean that its foundation is Armenian. Uh, same thing with, uh, let's say, uh, here's an example. Uh, I get iron from China for me to use it for a building. And I, I, I built the building. Is it a Chinese building? It's not. But I need to acknowledge that I got my iron from China. Same thing with this one. Just because, you know, all the surrounding things uh, are not kind of indicative of strictly Armenian, uh, you still need to acknowledge its foundation. And the king is already the foundation. It shows that it is, it is an Armenian uh, kingdom. And, of course, you know, Tigran the Great, here's the, his crown. As we can prove that, you know, it is the same crown. Uh, as far as for the language dispersion, we already had people from UCLA and Georgia saying that uh, it was uh, diffused out of Armenian highlands and went to different places. And, uh, and of course, we have more and more support that the Armenian plateau was the place where all the language was disseminated. So all this goes back to the falsifications. I, I keep trying to uh, show you that, you know, unless we use the data that we have, to confront, to publish, uh, to, to talk about these things, to make a quick correction as soon as possible, we're going to fade. We are going to fade. And we're kind of losing the war. Uh, but uh, let me see. Uh, I wish I could show a video by, by a German. It was a German television show, uh, and uh, Atkinson and Gray, and they were talking about uh, the origins of Indo-European languages. So they said that it took root in Armenian. But uh, I'll, I'll send it to you, and I guess in the video. So. And, uh, you know, even uh, Brian Hitley said as far as uh, for the Armenian language, uh, we're originators of letters and cultures which the world inherited through Greek and Romans. Greeks were the, merely the disseminators. It's very important uh, because, you know, if you look at dictionaries and everything else, mathematics and philosophy, you always have the Greeks and the, and the Latin as the forerunners. They don't talk about where they took that information from. You know, the whole world, uh, European culture considers itself the heir to the ancient Greek and Roman civilizations, not realizing that both of them in their turn originate from ancient Armenian civilization by Heinrich Schliemann. So they, they, they keep trying to tell this information uh, to, to people that can read and write and all that, but somehow we lost that, that, that threat. And I think that Greek and Latin is an easy access to something because we don't need to really go back that far but the thing is if we don't do that we lose the entire universe of people that came before them uh, you know let's take some words that we can easily convert into Armenian without really trying that much you know because the Troy you know we have the uh, you know God the and uh, now Armenians had literature so they had to have God of, of literature obviously and then cosmos, oh, oh, you can do this yourself too. Don't take my word for it. I mean, uh, cosmos os is already a Greek suffix. Let's put that on the side. Cosm is structure, and uh, cosm is structure in Armenian. Mathematics, matemat, even we call this matematik. Humanity started counting with fingers. It has to be matematik. And the thing is, 
Uh, in Greek, if you look at the root word of mathematics, you're not going to find it. It just says that it means the art of counting. Uh, anarchia, anarchy, without a king, anarcha, which means something without a king becomes anarchy with no ruler. Uh, cancer. In Greek, they say it's come from uh, that it looks like a crab with the veins. We really don't need to go through that if we can say kartz kef. And kartz means nutritional deficiency and then kef means sickness. So cancer is a sickness of nutritional deficiency. Imagine kartz kef is, is said by a Greek. They can't pronounce it anyway. Name me somebody that can kartz kef. They can do it. Uh, and old metal, uh, metalion in Greek, metal, why can we say metal? Uh, when, when you put, uh, the, there's a lot of uh, salt that's generated uh, if metal is exposed to some uh, water soluble. So we already have ah in there as part of the chemistry. So all that was known in Mesopotamia came from Armenia. Armenia is the absent fragment in the entire mosaic of the ancient world civilization. This was found after they discovered all these ho uh, horses and, and skeletons and so forth. They keep trying to say uh, astrology, all the uh, uh, 12 constellations were found in Armenia in, in its rough form. We also have that. Um, I have many more slides and they tell me it's time. So, uh, just tired, you want to go home? I don't know, you, you, you let me know. But uh, I, I, can, I can turn into a part two next time, but uh, I have a lot of slides. We can be here for a year, and then without any notes, I can talk for a year. Uh, because I speak from the heart, and, and the memory hasn't failed me yet. But if you guys got to go home, we can go home. But uh, I want to give you one last thing that all the uh, animal domestication, and sheep, and, and pigs, and cattle. As you can see, this is the Armenian highland. So obviously, when you have agriculture, you have animal domestication, you need to relay information to your colleague, right? Uh, you, you need structured language. You need to tell the guy, listen, uh, when you go over there and you pick up that slab, make sure it's not too heavy and then you bring it here and you construct. You gotta have a, you need to figure out how to speak. So either language influenced agriculture, animal domestication, or the force of that influenced language. That is a difficult thing to find. But I personally think that language uh, opened up uh, human civilization to go from hunter and gatherer to uh, civilization. Anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. That was Appreciate great. It. Impressive as always, my friend. That was uh, a lot of information to digest. I hope you guys... So sorry for the, the fire hose, but sometimes you uh, <laughs> there. <laughs> so, um, you know, all this information that you presented, um, what we need to figure out is how do we fight this? Yeah, how do we stop it? Um, we had... Uh, one of our episodes yesterday, we had, again, the constant question is, how do we fight this? What is the solution? Um, and I think the solution is that we need to start reading more books and sharing it with one another, uh, teaching our kids. There's amazing books out there that have so much information about our history. Funding more movies. Funding more movies. We talked about it last night. You mentioned about the billionaires we have. Um, you know, there's there stories that that talk about let's call it Urartu, but it's actually the Ararat Kingdom um, that are factual, that can be turned into movies or even docu series that um, will just wow people around the world. So, what we want to do, the point of all this is for you guys to know that there is this information war going on, and we need to make sure that we fight back. And the way we fight back is individually learning about our history, learning the facts, and sharing it, making a uh, dinner conversation. Instead of talking about, you know, pointless things at dinner, talk about our history with your kids. Don't make it this kind of, you know, heavy, I'm, but 
uh, make it light, tell the stories. But first, you have to learn yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, share it with your non-Armenians, non-Armenian friends or family members, because they will see eventually how we are all connected together. Because that's where civilization began. Yeah. Yeah. So. And I would uh, also add that something more that we can do is uh, we need to create an international front of anti-defamation and hate speech. Uh, that's why I asked uh, Tuan to come because he's always exposed to uh, circumstances of, of hate and how Washington should address it. And I think that this is an international uh, subject that we require international attorneys to make a point at the UN and, and UNESCO level for us to change. But yes, you know, documentaries are, but you have to make a powerful change because it will uh, show others, all the cultures, that you can do the same to preserve yours. Uh, but at the same fire, time, fire, even fire, fire with fire. Yeah, we you have know? to. Uh, talk about our it. children and, and the youth, uh, they need to uh, write and publish more. You know, this is the information age. We need to translate all the good books in Armenia uh, into English, right? For people to know. Maybe people like just to read the information. Yeah. Uh, anyway. There's some amazing information out there. Armenian books. We've we've talked about this on our show mm -hmm. that we need to uh, translate them. If you know, there, there's like I said, the wealth we have, we need to bring it to the forefront. Of course. So, uh, having said that, uh, I want to thank uh, a few people who helped us put this together. Um, uh, for short notice, I mean, we did this in a matter of know, two right. and a half weeks. Yeah. Uh, first of all, Vaughn, thank you okay. uh, for coming up with this idea and, and you know, again, joining forces with us. Uh, I want to thank the Glendale Youth Center. Uh, Karadin uh, Karazian, who sitting in the back. Thank you, brother, for helping us put this together. Um, I want to thank all the artists that you got all this artwork you see here and outside. Uh, one of the artists is actually Lucy, uh, Lucy Gregory, um, the, the outside artist. She's amazing. I'm sure you guys saw yeah, this. Yeah. So she's actually going to be donating one of her uh, uh, pictures to. The, the organization here, and uh, it's called Night Flowers, which is worth $4,000, and she's donating it to you guys. So thank you to her. Uh, so all, all, all the pictures here are from artist Tigran Ovumian. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Tigran Ovumian. Uh, by the way, these are available if you want to purchase them. So you can approach the artist and uh, you know talk to them if you're interested. Uh, I want to thank Sadman from Gabriela's Eats for helping us with the catering. Um, if you guys, you know, help, uh, if you have another event, please get her information and uh, use her catering service. Um, let's see, uh, who else? Uh, I would like to thank uh, Edgar Akopian from the uh, Support Our Heroes organization. That's a very uh, important organization, guys. Uh, they, do, uh, they do amazing work in Artsakh and Armenia. Every dollar that you donate goes to their projects. Uh, so definitely, we have their little um, like a, a QR code outside. You guys can scan it and donate. Um, thank you to Eurostyle Production for the photography. Thank you over in the back. We appreciate it. Last minute again, everybody showed up. Uh, Jim, who's a friend of mine from Knees Printing, for putting all this stuff together. Last minute again. And I want to thank, finally, I want to thank our friends and family who showed up today. Thank you, guys. We truly thank appreciate you. it. Um, I don't know if the boys left, but I want to say a special thank you to the Wise Nuts podcast. Uh, Armand, Arno, and Edgar was always supporting us. Uh, thank you, guys. We appreciate it. Follow them, you know. Uh, to our listeners and viewers on uh, YouTube and uh, Facebook, thank you, guys. To all our uh, followers, we could not have done this, uh, in, you know, without your support. Um, anything you want to add? Before yeah, we call well, it I know Hamlet uh, yeah. has one thing to say.
Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot coming from you, Hamlet. So appreciate it. It means a lot. You know, you're uh, you're one of the giants out there. And and what I want to say is, uh, if we allow the 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 light of this candle uh, diminish, uh, we are going to see darkness all over human civilization because it's we're going to lose a uh, you know the the cradle of human civilization, and. Uh, will be all, all will be in this array as far as people trying to figure out who's what and all that it's gonna be a huge gap uh, so I hope that you know the, all this information that I relate will give you the power for you to examine things yourself a reasonable and rational approach to things and I hope that uh, actually I had a slide of all the books that I asked you to uh, kind of buy if you can I had that slide but that that came out 50 more slides after <laughs> Next one, part two. Next one. Maybe we can do part two with, yeah. uh, with your blessing. So thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Thank you. All right, everybody. Um, as Make sure you follow us, MedHeadersNet Podcast. Subscribe to it. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. And yeah. as we always say, end of the show, uh, respect one another, love one another. And until the next episode, take care of yourselves.